At the start of March last year, I asked a senior member of the government if they were worried about coronavirus. Their answer was, personally, no. Eight people in England have tested positive for coronavirus. Wash your hands from national anthem. You must stay at home. Now, we've lost more than the population of a small city to the disease. 100,000 deaths. I've talked to more than 20 senior politicians, officials and former officials. Those who were in the room making the decisions. They agreed to talk on the basis of anonymity. What moments, what mistakes do they remember? So I shook hands with everybody. And ended up on the outskirts of Barnet Castle Town. This is what they were thinking as we all watched on. The virus arriving in Italy was when it sank in for most. Like a scene from a nightmare that Italy is now living. The government had been talking about the virus for weeks, but some on the inside say it was seen as hysteria. It's just like flu. Images of patients dying on trolleys in Europe changed that. One of the world's best healthcare systems is near breaking point. Ministers say the chief medical officer had told them if it gets out of China, it becomes global. It went from not on the radar to people on the floor of hospitals in Lombardy. That was the moment we knew it was inevitable, said one senior minister. After several weeks of COBRA meetings, described by one attendee as a disaster. Are we prepared enough, Ms Hancock? It was becoming obvious that the preparations weren't good enough. The government machine was breaking in our hands, an insider told me. Number 10 had started to prepare the public. But although it was never a firm proposal, officials had even talked about chicken pox parties to help the virus spread among the healthy population. The conversations were totally in the wrong universe, one source said. But a tiny group of advisers confronted the Prime Minister with evidence on Saturday the 14th of March, showing graphs to him that suggested without tougher, faster action, the NHS would collapse. This was growing fast and the thing that was really worrying and the thing that really sticks in my mind is that we had those reasonable worst case scenarios of hundreds of thousands of deaths and the problem with them was that they were coming true. So we knew we had to act and that Monday I went to Parliament and said that all unnecessary social contact should be stopped and I remember saying it, it was one of those moments that I, I couldn't believe that I was having to say these words to Parliament. Lockdown was coming. It was all so new. We were more blind than we told the public, one official admits. And it was another nine days before the full legal limits came into force. The threat to the country was clear, but something more personal soon struck. Tonight at 10, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been taken to intensive care. This is obviously a very serious moment for the government and the Whitehall machine. Cabinet ministers were summoned urgently on the phone. All of a sudden, we were asked to join a call, not knowing if he was alive, one of them said. The most serious of discussions took place. There was a one in four chance we had to plan for a full transition, I was told. But strikingly, there was no fixed protocol. Who's in charge of the government? Well, the government's business will continue, um, and the Prime Minister is in safe hands with a brilliant team. Boris Johnson is by no means universally liked, but the country spiralling into crisis could for a moment have lost its Prime Minister. The gravity of the situation was profound and the danger from the pandemic personal and so real. After two months of strict rules, news broke that in turn broke the political consensus. Tonight, The Guardian and The Mirror newspapers are reporting that subsequently he in fact travelled to his parents' home in Durham. It's not a good look, Mr Cummings, is it? MPs and some ministers were furious, demanding at the least he should apologise. Others have told me he should have quit straight away. But with the Prime Minister's backing, he ended up defending himself at the strangest of press conferences in Downing Street's back garden. Sorry, I'm late. I thought the best thing to do in all the circumstances was to drive to an isolated cottage on my father's farm. Perhaps the public was ready to be angry about something with someone, but the political atmosphere turned sour. The cabinet minister said there'd been tremendous goodwill. The early pandemic washed away the bitterness of Brexit, but that came flooding back 
all that bile, all that frustration. And for many of those I've talked to, it was a terrible turning point in a national emergency. But in Downing Street, the belief is that the public may already have started to tire. By the summer, with cases falling and many rules relaxed, we didn't feel like a country in the grip of a pandemic, even encouraged to eat out. Hello. Schools and universities returned, but the testing system couldn't cope with everyone. It's an absolute joke. I've got to bring you three kids out of school. And by September, one source says the data was already screaming out about the risk. In the middle of the month, a senior figure told me, if you do nothing now, by the end of October, you'll get something worse than the first wave. There was frustration among some in Downing Street about the Prime Minister's attitude, sometimes appearing to be in let it rip mode. What I said to the Prime Minister over the summer is, review what's gone on, there's likely to be a second wave, and don't make the same mistakes again, because I think that's unforgivable. I then said, went public saying, we're going to have to have a circuit break. That was a big decision for me, because we had been supporting the government, and now for the first time on a big issue, we were going to part company, I might have given you the benefit of the doubt in the first wave, but you didn't learn the lessons and you went and repeated the very same mistakes into the autumn. Boris Johnson resisted calls for a short, sharp, partial lockdown, sticking instead to a system of local restrictions. They are asking us to gamble on a strategy that their own experts tell them might not work. Ministers got stuck in silly standoffs, one official said, with local leaders. But Tory MPs were resisting stricter rules. But one source told me in anger, we kept repeating the same mistakes over and over again. We lost an awful lot of time. Another senior figure says the biggest mistake was the rush of blood to the head in the summer. And the Prime Minister has to carry the can. Of course, we needed to make sure that we kept the virus under control and take into account all the other considerations, the economic ones, for instance. But from the middle of September, there were people in government saying, you're going to have to toughen things up, you're going to have to go faster. And a lot of people think, actually, that the Tory party and the Prime Minister just didn't want to listen to that. No, we listened to all of the evidence all the way through, but you've got to balance all of the different considerations. You know, it's only at the Prime Minister's desk that all these different considerations come together. Yet some believe Boris Johnson can't be blamed. There was no slam-dunk recommendation, said one senior minister. It was a reasonable set of judgments to make. No one knew then either about the new variant. Back on the ward, the oxygen levels plummet of a COVID patient. But looking back, no one wanted to believe the disease would return as it did. But for some of the decision makers still in government, the missed moments of September had a profound effect setting a course for a terrible second wave. Time and again, those who made the choices cite one big success, throwing everything at finding a vaccine. The Prime Minister had been attacked when he decided not to take part in the EU's collective effort. But ministers and officials say that was an easy decision because the UK wouldn't have had control. Instead, they had resolved to pay high, pay early, and ensure it works at home. I remember the meeting when I said to the team, think to a year ahead, what would we regret not having tried now in a year's time? And about five or six hands went up on the screens and loads of things came through. We need enough vials to put the vaccine in. We need the fill and finish capacity. Uh, we need to start producing it even before we know that it's going to be uh, effective. Ministers resolved to set aside the normal rules with testing and new drugs, the vaccine was the way out. The project was vital, but uncertain. Much of it was secret too. The vaccines even had code names, named after submarines to protect commercial confidentiality. Now, that early choice to push alone for a vaccine seems a stroke of genius, but back then it was a real gamble. A senior minister said it was plausible and we didn't have a better strategy. A government that had been lambasted so often for busting convention did it again, but this time with a stunning outcome. I still remember the moment that, uh, that the team walked in the door and they said, we've got it, it works and we can go. This generation of decision makers and the fabric of the state have been stretched in a way they just hadn't been for decades, but so have we. One senior minister told me they have to accept 
but it's perfectly possible to be wrong. But those who made the decisions are all too aware that mistakes in these last 12 months may have had such a terrible cost.